Well, a very good morning to you. Thank you so much for being part of this particular morning show. My name is Ram Maguk and this is Why in the Morning. Uh, we are coming to you live from the broadcasting house here in Nairobi, Kenya. We are also live on our website at www.kvc.co.ke forward slash Y254. So ensure that you engage with us as we continue with this particular morning show. Remember, you can watch us from where at the comfort of your morning or of your living room. Today, it's all about understanding cancer, uh, uh, palliative care, especially when it comes to cancer patients and much more. Today I want to find out what is palliative care? What is it that we need to look out for when it comes to palliative care? And how uh, do palliative care providers you know, do their job? How do they ensure that you get the best uh, uh, care from uh, where, wherever you are? How do they do it? Is it from home, from the, the hospitals? How do they move around? Uh, and what are the do's and the don'ts that uh, they really consider when they're giving care to patients? Remember palliative care is given to different kinds of patients we shall find out what is it that uh, what, what kind of patients we give and uh, why is it that we have so many of them being actually cancer patients today let's talk about cancer prevention also I, in this conversation i'm joined by none other than dr esther Muinga. he she is a palliative care specialist thank you and thank you for finding time to join me how are you because i'm fine thank you very much asante sana yeah. ensure that you engage with us keep the conversation going the hashtag is why in the morning at ram aguko and at y254 channel uh, you can bring in your questions as you continue with this program also let tell us where you're watching us from and we shall sample your feedback as we continue with today's show dr Tari, let's find out before uh, before we, we we touch on um on, on, on the nitty gritties by definition for those who may not understand what you're talking about here what is palliative care uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Ram. Uh, palliative care is a specialized type of care that looks at improving the quality li of life of a patient and the family. Mm -hmm. So in, in simple terms, we are looking at um, a patient who has a life-threatening illness. By this, we mean a condition that is difficult to cure or they're living in a... Uh, They've had an expected uh, difficult diagnosis mm -hmm. and now they need support to work with them throughout the journey. Mm -hmm. So we are looking at improving the quality of life of this patient and also their family. And uh, is there any particular uh, um, disease that is associated with palliative care? And uh, why is it that we see most of it? Because I'm seeing most of the palliative care providers mm -hmm. are associated with cancer. Is, the can is cancer the only one or do we have others? Uh, yeah, so palliative care uh, benefits a number of diagnoses. So if you have a patient with, um, you've mentioned cancer being the commonest, mm -hmm. Uh, if you look at the burden of cancer in Kenya, it's, mm -hmm. it's really growing. Yes. Um, cancer is, the, is documented to be the biggest burden in terms of the palliative care need. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you think about other life-threatening conditions, or serious health suffering of patients with a hard to cure diagnosis, mm. we are look at, looking at patients with HIV and mm -hmm. AIDS, mm -hmm. patients with um, organ failures, like a patient you've heard of a lot of patients needing dialysis because they have renal failure. Mm -hmm. That's a patient who benefits from palliative care. Mm -hmm. Patients with congenital, that is children, congenital malformations, mm -hmm. uh, like those ones with heart issues. So they need support to work with them throughout the journey. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Most times they would be receiving care um, aimed at not really, it might not really end up with cure. Some do get cure, mm -hmm. but if you look at it, some will end up living with this for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, so we've talked about cancer, HIV, congenital malformations for children, mm -hmm, sometimes mm -hmm. birth disorders, uh, if they had uh, cerebral palsy because of birth issues, mm -hmm. um, patients with mental health issues, dementia, mm -hmm. all these benefit from palliative wow, wow, care. Wow, wow, wow. So it's a wide range, mm -hmm. you just need to look at uh, how is it affecting their quality of life. Yeah. Okay, and uh, if you look at um, all these uh, different uh, um, you know uh, diseases that uh, exist the, the different conditions that are there what are some of the most uh, common challenges that you, you you experience as a palliative care provider as you you are on the field and uh, you are administering care to these particular patients suffering from different conditions mm -hmm. yet at the same time yes it can be challenging mm. yeah yeah so um 
I think to start with, palliative care is not, um, the service is not well known. So mm -hmm. what happens is most patients will actually be referred for palliative care at end of life. But palliative care services ideally should begin from diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So if we are talking a about a patient who has uh, a diagnosis of breast cancer, for example, yeah. when they are going through their uh, curative treatment or uh, medical therapy with the oncologist, they're also receiving palliative care. So mm. both therapies go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And um, depending on the outcomes of care at the oncologist's uh, office, mm. um, one would usually decrease. So sometimes if um, uh, the curative treatment is not really successful, uh, what happens is now that they, they'll receive more of palliative care and less of the curative therapies. I, I, initially, you, you had mentioned that uh, we mostly go for palliative care towards death. Towards, yes. Um, what are you uh, referring to particularly in, the, in this area? Towards, are you saying when the, is at the last stages, when things are so bad? That, that's, that's when most referrals are actually done. Okay. But we want to okay. change that so that if, yeah. I, if I have a diagnosis today, mm -hmm. uh, my healthcare team mm -hmm. needs to tell me about palliative care as a patient. Mm -hmm. So I'm receiving palliative care. I'm still okay. I'm of sound mind. I can mm -hmm. make decisions. Mm -hmm. I'm not very sick. Uh, whether I, I worsen with my diagnosis, whether I improve, you see mm -hmm. I'm still receiving this palliative, palliative care, care services. Right, right, right. So initially... Yeah. Um, Healthcare workers would take care of these patients, and then when you've tried all the therapies, they've gone to India, they've come back, you've done um, everything you've thought would work. That's when they go for palliative That's care. That's when now they say, now let's refer you to a palliative care center. So you see, at that time, the patient is even tired, mm. the doctor is tired, so they feel you're giving up on them, mm -hmm. but it's not giving up. Mm -hmm. Ideally, if you start working with the patient from diagnosis, it makes it easy for them to cope with the illness. So one challenge that you're facing is this belief system or this trend that we go for palliative care to when it's actually getting late. Yes, yes. And we need to change that particular ideology, that particular belief system. Yes. Um, when, when, when you're on the field, what, what, what other challenges do you face when dealing with patients as a palliative care provider? Uh, there's, there, there are many issues also to do with um, mm -hmm. Uh, financial uh, capabilities of these patients. Mm -hmm. uh, if you think about it, uh, if someone has a heart or a serious health suffering or a serious illness, mm -hmm. most likely they'll have used a lot of resources looking mm -hmm. for therapies. So mm -hmm. by the time they are coming to a palliative care provider or by the time they are seeking support, mm -hmm. you see that they are. They are you might recommend medicines and they tell you, I'm not able to buy. Mm -hmm. uh, medicines like pain medications like morphine and they tell you, I can't afford it. Mm -hmm. So how do you take care of these patients? So there's a lot of social, financial uh, issues. And then in terms of family support, I think that's mm -hmm. also a very big issue. Yeah, a patient yeah. who has this diagnosis will face a lot of uh, psychosocial issues because of lack of family support, mm -hmm. friends leave you, so mm -hmm. someone was telling me the other day that they, when they had a diagnosis of breast cancer, it seems like their friends used to do things without her because they felt that she was always sick. Mm. But for her, she said she wished they would check on her even when, um, when she refused. So you oh. see, that, that aspect okay. really brings them down as a patient. Mm. So sometimes mm -hmm. they'll, they'll tell you... Um, I don't feel like doing this, but just being there and being present for mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. really uh, plays a big role. And, and how is it for cancer patients specifically? Because now th those are general um, challenges for many patients. Yes. Uh, do you have those that cancer patients, um, you know, uh, that you experience while dealing, handling cancer patients? Yeah, sure. So for, for cancer specifically, mm. uh, we still have the issues with finances, finances. because you know, uh, for them to go get uh, chemotherapy or mm. radiotherapy, mm -hmm. uh, they would need to go to a radiotherapy center. So we have radiotherapy in Nairobi, in Eldoret. Mm -hmm. If you're coming from somewhere further than that, it means you have costs in Kade. Yeah. It means even your cost of uh, transport, accommodation, and treatment is mm -hmm. high. Mm -hmm. And then the social challenges remain the same for them. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of, uh, think about the, the, they've lost work uh, work time. So 
some have actually lost jobs because mm -hmm. of that. Uh, you've consumed a lot of your time going for therapy, mm -hmm. for treatment, mm -hmm. and your employer decides we can't keep you anymore. Okay. Yes. Now, um, because, I, I, I want, because we mostly deal with cancer patients, mm -hmm. I want us to touch on um, palliative care for, for cancer patients. Mm -hmm. um, what are the, the steps that you go through while offering palliative care for, for cancer patients? Uh, so once a patient has, uh, has a confirmed diagnosis, because you need a, a tissue diagnosis from the oncologist or from the hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, so for example, they've been told they have cervical cancer. They're receiving uh, therapy at a cancer center, and mm -hmm. we have many in Kenya. They would uh, also be enrolled to palliative care. And the palliative care team would uh, work with them starting from the issue of the accepting the diagnosis because that's the first step mm. and then as they go through the therapy issues come up so for example um, things like pain management that's mm. really a big burden for patients mm -hmm. uh, pain because of the illness pain because of the therapy they might be using mm -hmm. and then they also have um, to accept that they need this support because you can't force the care on someone you mm. ha they have to agree is, so, it, is, is it like you, need, you also need to be a psychologist at the same time? Uh, yeah. No. Uh. So you see, we've talked about pain management. Yes. We've talked about they are getting their chemo, their radiotherapy, wherever they are. Uh. They are getting psychosocial support, spiritual support. From, so it's, from it's others? A, yes. Or so from the same palliative care provider? So, so it's, it needs a multidisciplinary team approach. Okay. So what happens, you have the palliative care specialist leading the team. Mm -hmm. If they need nutritional support, um, their feeding uh, patterns might have changed, you engage your uh, nutritionist. Uh -huh, they uh -huh. have uh, spiritual issues, they're questioning life, those mm. questions that come up, why me, they're not at peace, mm -hmm. a spiritual caregiver comes in. Uh, they need uh, uh, physiotherapy, maybe they're not able to walk or they're not able to do a certain activity. Mm -hmm. So you see they need the physiotherapist, the occupational therapist, they would need a speech therapist if they've lost a voice. Yeah, so yeah, it's, it's yeah. a team approach. So it's mm -hmm. a team uh, service mm -hmm. and not by one person. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, I'm, I, I, I'm looking at the, 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 the process that, that uh, you go through all this. Mm -hmm. You said you, you've got different specialists mm -hmm. coming on board. Mm -hmm. um, it means we are working with uh, a team. Yes. Now, um, for, for a, a patient, at what level is it that uh, this team um, is to be able to you know, work on that, that plan to be able to attend the patient? Mm -hmm. Are you starting from the time that they get the diagnosis um, at the hospital, mm -hmm. where they're still in hospital? Yes, so that's the ideal situation. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the cancer centers that are being set up in Kenya, mm. The recommendation is there has to be a palliative care center at that facility. Okay. So okay. once they are going through this uh, uh, cancer care, uh, for example, the palliative care team comes on board and uh, works with the patient. So they have a plan of mm -hmm. care. So you, and you have goals of care for this particular patient. So it patient. should start from the hospital, not from home. Uh, Ideally, it will start from the hospital where mm. the diagnosis is made. Okay. But yeah. the care can yeah. be given whether they're in hospital mm -hmm. or at home. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, for many cancer, uh, cancer uh, patients, you know, you mentioned it earlier on, mm. that they complain about uh, the financial implications because cancer is expensive, you know, mm. going through the chemo and all those visits. Does Palliative care have the ability also to, you know, cushion a cancer patient from feeling these diverse effects of, uh, uh, you know, funding and uh, med the, the medical expenses. Mm. So it's it's a challenge that cuts across uh, many medical conditions. Let's mm -hmm. uh, say that. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, cushioning patients against this financial strain. Mm -hmm. We know we've had a lot of talks in Kenya about universal health coverage yeah, so yeah. that patients are cushioned and families and they don't have to suffer uh, financial distress. Exactly. Yeah. Um, we also talk about having insurance covering uh, these uh, patients. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the market, most insurance companies now have uh, uh, covers for cancer and now our advocacy bit because I work with the National Palliative Care Association mm -hmm. is ensuring that 
these patients are not, uh, you know, those fine prints that are usually written that yeah. um, care is only given in the facility, it cannot mm. be given at home. So yes, 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 how yes. do you make sure that home-based care is also covered within this uh, insurance package? NHIF does cover cancer and it covers, if, if you go mm. to a cancer center in, in Kenya, you will get these palliative mm. care services as you get your cancer services. Mm -hmm. um, if you're not accredited by NHIF, that means that financial cover is not there. Mm -hmm. But there's much that can be done because um, if you're looking at uh, giving services for these patients where they are, mm -hmm. we need to make sure that the cover is giving them support even if they're getting home-based care. Mm -hmm. So they don't have to be admitted in a facility, but mm -hmm. the health worker or the health teams, um, like we have hospices around the country, they're mm -hmm. able to do home visits for patients mm -hmm. and they're able to do teleconsults for patients so that mm -hmm. they don't have to travel uh, the whole mile just to get a, a yeah, yeah. support. So, so, you, so it means you also give recommendations yes. in regards to what they also need to do as individuals. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I'm seeing a comment here. This is um, Marcy. Is, Marcy is asking, at what point uh, do you start giving palliative care? Do you need to wait till uh, someone is uh, badly off for them to start getting palliative care? I, I, I know you, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned that a bit earlier on mm -hmm. when we started. Yes. Maybe you can answer her. Yes, thanks Marcy for your question. Palliative care uh, needs to start from diagnosis. Yeah. And what we are also encouraging is that if, if you're a family member or mm. you're a patient, ask your doctor about palliative care services. Because mm -hmm. sometimes someone focuses on their speciality and they mm. forget other things. So even mm -hmm. uh, patient and patients engaging healthcare workers uh, helps make sure that these patients get the services they require. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so uh, so uh, keep commenting, keep co talking to us. The hashtag is why in the morning at Ramagoko on that Y254 channel. Ask your questions and we shall be able to answer them with Dr. Tari here. All right. So um, you, you're saying that we need to take advantage of the universal health coverage plan and, uh, you know, of course, the hospices are there to uh, ensure that. Uh, uh, cancer patients are uh, you know well advised mm -hmm. in regards to what they need to do but now um, I want us to look at still on part of uh, advisory mm -hmm. cancer prevention um, what are the uh, things that we need to do to prevent ourselves from uh, from cancer mm -hmm. coming from a palliative care provider mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, yeah, so the first step actually for prevention is mm. uh, what, what we call primary prevention. So mm -hmm. we know we, we've, I'm sure we've had a lot of talk about um, how do you keep yourself away from, from cancer. So there, there, there are simple steps that people can always take up and follow. Mm -hmm. uh, first being our diets, mm -hmm. um, what we eat, taking care of what goes into your mouth. So mm -hmm. being proactive about it and being intentional about it. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, uh, looking at reduction of refined sugars because mm. we, we tend to eat a lot of that in our diets. Mm -hmm. uh, fatty foods, so we are looking at do you always, are you always taking deep fried foods? Mm -hmm. um, a little oil is good but too much now becomes harmful, harmful to you. Yeah. So we have diet, we have issues to do with exercise, staying fit, walking, mm -hmm. do you mm -hmm. take the lift, do you take the stairs, mm -hmm. do you walk to the matatu stage, do you mm -hmm. take a boda boda to the stage, mm -hmm. um, how active are you during the day, are you seated the whole day, mm -hmm. those are also risk factors. Salt in the diet uh, has also been associated with uh, uh, your risk of cancer and non-communicable diseases, so uh, to say. Well, you know, w w w when, you, when you mentioned salt and, uh, and, and fatty food, uh, you know, I'm reminded of uh, scenarios where people like adding salt, you know, on the, yes, on the table. On the table. Yeah. And yes. <laughs> In fact, that is, that is really discouraged. Mm. Um, I know a few people who do that. They, <laughs> before even you test the food, before and most they, likely the food has some salt. And, and they like <laughs> doing that before they test. Yes. So... So you see, those are things that you can intentionally change. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you don't need all that. Salt is still good. It has mm -hmm. some iodine, but mm -hmm. too much uh, or rather in excess that becomes harmful to you. And sometimes people, people believe that uh, chakula ni mafuta. That if you see, if, you sure. know, that oil yes. you know, dripping, dripping yes. and you feel like ah, chakula ni people, uh, which should not be the case. 
ni kama kuweka soup so others will put a lot of soup these ones are floating in oil yes yeah. which is which is also expensive for you mm -hmm. so if you think about your expenses in the household <laughs> yeah the other things are screening uh -huh. so screening is um simply looking for any issues in someone's body when they are healthy they mm -hmm. don't have any symptom mm -hmm. and there are simple uh, cancers that can be screened in kenya we have cervical cancer whose screening is really affordable and available mm -hmm. and i uh, if you think about cervical cancer is one of the cancers that are preventable yeah. so if you take up a screening uh, package regularly every year or every two years and all these things depend on the patient so you need mm -hmm. to talk to your healthcare provider about it so that they advise and you uh, use the uh, correct route so we have cervical cancer screening that mm -hmm. is done right. breast cancer screening and in october there's a lot of awareness around that mm -hmm. we have it available for for women and for men too uh, we also talk about uh, uh, screening for if, if you have a family history of a certain cancer mm -hmm. you are also eligible for screening mm -hmm. you're not saying because someone in your family has the cancer you'll also get it mm -hmm. but uh, it's, research it's has to, shown that yeah, yeah because you're, you're exposed to similar environments mm -hmm. you might have similar risk factors mm -hmm. you might end up with a similar diagnosis so it's good to you know go for screening yes. as a preventive measure yes um, uh, when, when, and, and, and the reason why I'd ask this is because, you know, for many people, you, we, we, we may think that palliative care is just all about, you know, you wait, get the disease, and then, and yeah. then you get palliative care. Mm. But actually, you need to also learn how to prevent yourself from, uh, you know, um, uh, getting cancer. Because even as a cancer patient, there's, there are those things you need to do. Mm -hmm. There is the way your lifestyle need, needs to change now, even yes. including your diet. So that it doesn't get worse. Mm. Is that true? Uh, I, I would say that the diet you're telling the patient with cancer to follow is, you see, you're talking about a healthy diet or a healthy routine. Yeah. That is what I should also be doing. Mm -hmm. But sometimes uh, recommendations in terms of diet are made based on the patient's uh, for example, their kidney is not working well, mm -hmm. so there are things that they are told do not do, right? Mm -hmm. So those are specific things. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, if we talk about uh, when, when we are telling, uh, for example, this conversation when patients uh, talk about if I have diabetes, I have a diabetic diet, mm -hmm. you know, you're, 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 you're basically saying that this patient needs to avoid some things and take some things, which is what we should actually be doing as uh, people who are not patients yet yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah so if if we can adopt that and if we look online there are many uh, recommendations but you have to look at what is approved we have organizations that are credible like mm -hmm. the world health organization mm -hmm. our ministry of health kenya also has guidelines that give recommendations on the same mm -hmm. yeah so if, if i have a diagnosis of cancer um my lifestyle needs to improve, yes, as you've said, mm -hmm. uh, but even my family's lifestyle needs to be the same. So that I'm not the only one walking this journey and mm -hmm. I feel like an outcast or people are um, I'm doing things differently. Mm -hmm. It's usually better if everyone in the family does the same. Yeah. Now, um, I want us to touch on, uh, on this particular angle of the workplace. Now, You'll, you'll realize that the person that you are giving palliative care is, uh, you know, is employed, mm -hmm. needs to, you know, at some point show up for work. Yes. They need to leave the house, you know, go do something so that they can put food on the table mm -hmm. and even get money for, or funds to cater for them, those medical expenses. Mm -hmm. How do you balance and train mm -hmm. this uh, a patient, you know, to be able to balance this kind of work life, mm -hmm. uh, work and uh, palliative care? Mm -hmm. That's, that's very important because as, um, as we talk about palliative care, we are talking about person-centered care. Yes. We are looking at this pers uh, person um, holistically. Mm. So they're not just someone with a diagnosis of cancer. There are people with a family around them. And that's mm. why we say palliative care involves the patient and the family, yeah. and the community around them. Mm. So when they are... Um, employed their rec uh, employers have recommendations of how many days you need to be at work uh, sick offs and those things so there's a lot of awareness that needs to be done also for employers to um, embrace this 
patients mm -hmm. or uh, their workforce because they're still their workforce. So uh, are you saying you, you're like you need to be there to bridge the gap between the patient and the employer? Yes, because those those policy changes need to be done. For example, we've talked about patients who've lost their jobs. It mm -hmm. means they had to go for care and treatment and they lost uh, some time off work. Mm. And the employer might have, because, because they have uh, certain policies in the workplace that say, you need to be here so many hours or so many days in a year. Mm -hmm. You've lost this, so we can't keep you anymore. Yeah. So the balance needs to be there. The, there are employers who have given uh, patients going through therapy, like days off, mm -hmm. or they're able to work flexible hours at the workplace. So you know they, they're still able to work. You know, we are not, we are not saying they are um, uh, now getting really different treatment and you're saying their patients in the hospital. No, they're no, able no, to work, no. but mm -hmm. they need to keep up with their medical appointments mm -hmm. so that they're even more productive at the workplace. Mm -hmm. So if, mm -hmm. for example, they are overworked, they end up sick, you see, they become um, admitted and you lose even more days. Mm -hmm. But if you're able to make sure that they are... Uh, not missing their medical appointments. Mm -hmm. um, they have a good medical cover because that's also a big aspect. And then they, they also have that support from the employers, the, the employer and the other um, workmates. So mm -hmm. that if I need some time off, I know someone can cover for me for a few mm -hmm. hours and I'm back. All right. So that it's also a team approach in the workplace. Mm -hmm. yes. But at the, at the same time, there are, there are occupational hazards mm -hmm. and uh, that can be able to affect uh, a, a patient. You know, how are you able to, to gauge um, these things? What do you need to, how, how do you do it so that you can be able to give uh, your, your patient the best service mm -hmm. regardless of uh, the occupation they occupy? Mm -hmm. And uh, how are you able to prevent them from the occupational hazards that, ex that are there? Mm. So some employers have actually given um, or changed the employees' terms or what ex uh, work they were actually doing before. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's that aspect of, uh, for example, they have a week back, yeah? They were doing manual work mm -hmm. or they were standing for long hours. So that can be changed, they're given another department where they don't have to stand for too long. Mm -hmm. um, if it was a place, for example, um, they have a lung issue, they're working in a painting factory or somewhere there's a lot of dust, they will mm -hmm. be given alternative duties. Yeah, so that yeah. discussion needs to be, to happen. Mm -hmm. um, even as a palliative care provider, as I'm talking to the patient, I need to know um, where they are working, uh, what support um. they need in terms of, in, mm -hmm. in terms of, in uh -huh. terms of um, the, their, their support in there employment space but some mm. are not employed so you also need to look at can they engage in income generating activities mm -hmm. so that they keep going or mm. do something else that is not a lo uh, really strenuous for them but, but, but sometimes uh, i know it, it can be hard yes. can, and and, can, and I, I, I don't know if it, it has been for you can, mm. can it be challenging dealing with the different employers yes. because sometimes some of them can say no we don't have specialized mm. uh, uh, work environment so if this person cannot be able to adapt wow. to this, then they let them go. Yeah, and that's where the human rights aspects come in. Because mm -hmm. that is, it's, it's their right to work there. Mm -hmm. It's their right to, uh, to be listened to. So if this employer, there are many suits that have gone up for people who've been uh, illegally um, let go. So a lot of things come up, there are legal challenges. Mm -hmm. And when we are talking about palliative care and uh, the patients and families, you're looking at aspects to do with the uh, physical aspects, the legal issues that come up, and then there are spiritual issues that come up, mm. and there are just general well-being issues that come up in okay. terms of the care of the patient. All right, all right. And for someone who has a diagnosis of cancer, mm. uh, if, if I had, um, I was diagnosed with breast cancer today, mm. there's also risk of getting another cancer later. So you see the, the, the prevention, <laughs> or rather the, 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 the care of this patient does mm. not end at the end of, if they are given their radiotherapy, chemo, and they finish, mm -hmm. they need surveillance, they need and, to be followed up. And, and that's why it's important for us to talk about cancer prevention, because you can get mm -hmm. yet another cancer. Exactly. Wow. I exactly. want us to take a, a, a short break. Okay. But uh, after this, I want us to touch on now the family aspect, the stigmatization 
that you know the stigma that is there for a cancer patient, how is it mm -hmm. for a palliative care? And sometimes when you you enter that room, the environment, the mood that you get, you know, yes. you know, what are some of those times that you've just gotten into a house and you're and you're shocked, you're dumbfounded, wow, this is how people be treat their own kin, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and after that you shall be able to tell us a bit of your experience when it comes to dealing with different families, all right? Yeah. So Thank the, you. All right, so let's take that short break. After this, we'll be back with much more. Remember to keep it going on our social media handles. The hashtag is Why in the Morning at Ram Maguko and at Y254 channel. It's all about cancer prevention and awareness when it comes to palliative care. We are taking a short break. We'll be back in a... All right. Welcome back. As I said earlier on, we value your feedback. Let me just sample a few of your, 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 your comments on our social media handle and uh, get to see what people are saying. When you meet and down, pale, when you Facebook, the hashtag is why in the morning at Ramaguko. And that why254 channel is where you can be able to uh, send in your tweet. I'm seeing Vivian and I'm watching you from Kibra. I stand as Vivian. Interesting conversation there. I'm seeing this is... Uh, Maxwell and Asama watching you, uh, loving the show, enjoying the conversation. This is Augustine Asama. Good morning, watching live and direct from Ntengeni Kisau, Makwini County. Thank you so much, Augustine. No, no, Pia, you've sent in uh, 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 some some present there. Uh, Sam Kush and Asama watch uh, are, are present. Uh, good morning, good morning. Thanks so much, producer Magus. Magustu Babu, uh, uh, Red Lemon, and Sema is also enjoying the conversation. Tell us what you think about uh, this particular conversation on cancer awareness and prevention. Thank you, all, thank you also for letting us know where you're watching us from. Ensure that you also tell us uh, a bit more about um, you know, what you'd like to learn concerning cancer and palliative care. Now, um, Laktari, before we went on that break, we were talking about uh, how challenging it can be to be in the work environment and that th there are actually rights that are there for, 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 for workers. Uh, maybe you can touch a bit more about uh, this particular attribute. When uh, you, you are a cancer patient and you find it hard uh, to work and the work environment is not that conducive and positive and it is affecting you, uh, what would you advise such kind of a person to do? That's, a, that's quite a valid concern. Mm. Um, most times you'd have, you'd have heard of these patients who have uh, had a conversation with their HR departments. Most likely, if, if you're employed, there, there needs to be that conversation that takes place. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's difficult for the HR team to understand what the patient is going through. Mm -hmm. But I've found what works is if organizations are also empowered about the journeys these patients go, go mm -hmm. through, mm -hmm. or if they've had a similar experience, they're able to empathize with this patient. Mm -hmm. But the, the doctor to the patient can also write a recommendation letter mm -hmm. so that they take it to their employer and they're able to ha come to an agreement and see this is where we will balance and mm -hmm. this is what we'll agree to do so mm -hmm. that uh, both the organization and the patient benefit. Mm -hmm. So the patient is still earning a living, mm -hmm. the employer is still has the workforce running for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it, it can't be a one uh, uh, answer for all cases, mm -hmm. but it will have to be each person, mm -hmm. different approach based on what needs are there at yeah, that, right. at that it, point. It's, it's actually not a one size fits all. Exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and I love what you're saying. I, I want us to touch on uh, family stigma is there mm. so much and for some cancer patients when they are told when they when they get that diagnosis yeah. that they've got cancer some of them feel like it's a death sentence mm. oh no what are some of the experiences you've you've had when you're you know in, on, on the field there and you're dealing with families providing palliative mm. care and uh, you, you you can clearly see that right here this is stigmatization mm. stigma is it's quite a demoralizing uh, aspect in terms of care, mm -hmm. and you're right. Um, so in terms of uh, patient support and patient care, the family is usually the first line of support for the patient because yeah. you have the family, the patient and the family immediately around them. Mm -hmm. uh, so you see, if the family is supportive of this patient, the patient is able to thrive. Yeah. In many cases, um, even the patient themselves, once given a diagnosis of cancer, they would um, lose hope. 
so to say, maybe because of what they've had before. Mm -hmm. So now imagine the patient, uh, the patient's family around them. Mm -hmm. uh, most times, they, there, there are families that have uh, like distanced themselves from this person. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a patient in Nyeri who had a diagnosis of breast cancer, a lady. Um, she ended up being disowned by the husband. Wow. And the first issue with the husband was that um, he, he, he was saying that now she's, uh, she has one less breast, so mm. she has, uh, one was removed. Eh? The other issue is they thought she was going to die. Mm. So he, he really, like, it wasn't an official divorce, but you could see that she's been left on her own, mm -hmm. and that was her source of support. They have mm -hmm. big children, yeah. so where do you turn to? Uh, but the end was actually quite good for her because now she she learned she went through hospice care mm -hmm. she got support from the team uh, where she was mm -hmm. she now became a patient advocate so wow. what happens is if a patient has a diagnosis of cancer she'll mm -hmm. be able to talk to you and give you that encouragement because there's something about someone talking to you with a lived experience mm -hmm. as opposed to someone talking to you with uh, just technical experience mm -hmm. so they become good cancer ag advocates mm -hmm. or good palliative care advocates mm -hmm. in the community wow. and that's what we need because even in the in the counties people who've gone through these experiences are now becoming more vocal they mm -hmm. are they are asking for their rights yes they're asking that counties support their treatment and, I, I, and i'm seeing there is uh, this advocacy program uh, that uh, I, I i was following up they are mm -hmm. trying to make to say that cancer should be declared a national disaster exactly so from the patient's mouth it bears a lot of weight mm -hmm. because they've gone through they know where the shoe pinches yes, yes they're yes. able to articulate issues that are close to them because sometimes as policy makers Mm -hmm. You might think something else is a big burden, while actually the issue is something different. Mm -hmm. um, there's this example that was given of uh, the Kenyatta National Hospital team was looking at uh, um, issues that face the cancer patients. Mm. And something that came out is uh, the patients talked about having challenges with accommodation when they are going for care, mm -hmm. but also aspects of they don't have water to drink. Wow. So just having taps or having a dispenser or mm -hmm. having clean drinking water for them, those issues make a big difference. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, I want you to talk to the families outside there. Mm -hmm. Because now, I am fully aware that you for, I, I don't know if there are palliative care providers who stay in the homes. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, if, if they are there. Mm -hmm. Do you, but what I know is so far you work in shifts that those who are there or not but you can enlighten me on that how how is the work plan mm. and uh, de depending on the work plan there is there a time that now you leave the patient you know to be alone with the family how what would you advise this family now to how how should they be handling their patient mm -hmm. in a way that also uh, helps you so that when you when you're back the next day you don't have to start afresh mm. so uh, palliative care is provided in different settings mm -hmm. so there's the hospital setting yeah we have palliative care units within hospitals we have hospices that are standalone uh, centers that offer these services for patients mm -hmm. and home-based care is also offered mm -hmm. so what happens is based on the patient's needs and their location for example if i'm near a health facility it's easy for me to walk there and get support from the team mm -hmm. The palliative care providers or the hospice teams can visit you at your home, mm -hmm. depending on how, what agreements you have with them. Sometimes a patient is bedridden, they are not able to commute, mm. so it's easier for, to bring the health worker to them. Yes. Uh, there are instances where someone has needed to have 24-hour nursing, mm -hmm. so you'd employ someone to take care of you at home and offer that care, but they still consultation with the other team members so that they're receiving the holistic care and support mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and patients um, really prefer being at home when they're getting services remember we are talking about uh, long uh, maybe a lifelong illness uh, life-threatening illness it's not like malaria where you know the diagnosis is malaria take a tablet and you're fine tomorrow you test and you're fine this one, you might have it for years, 20 mm -hmm. years, five yeah, years, yeah. two years, two months, you don't know. Mm -hmm. So they prefer being at home. Um, so there are various mechanisms that can enable them receive the care at home. 
uh, either the health worker coming to, to visit them weekly or every two weeks, depending on how stable they are. Mm -hmm. They could be admitted to an inpatient facility, and we have a few around that offer uh, in hos inpatient hospice facility. Mm -hmm. And you're mm -hmm. able, as a family, you're able to visit your patient mm -hmm. um, as regularly as you wish. Mm -hmm. Remember, admissions also to hospitals, um, they limit, we, are, we usually limit the uh, visits to the patients because of the risk of infections, there are different mm -hmm. patients admitted. Yeah, yeah. But if in, they're in a hospice environment or they're in a specialized in, uh, inpatient facility organization for patients with such uh, similar illnesses, mm -hmm. it's easy to control that. Mm -hmm. It's easy to control patient visits. No. When they are at home, uh -huh. it's easy also to control the environment around them, the mm. noise, the food they're eating, who mm. is cooking for them, who is visiting them, and, and all that. Uh, and, but, but, but yet the family has, has a role to play. Yes, the, the family is, is the number one support for this patient. Uh -huh. And they know what the patient needs. Mm -hmm. But we also say that the patient needs to be engaged in those discussions. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the health worker making a decision. It's mm -hmm. not just the spouse making the decision for this other one or the parents making a decision for the child. Mm -hmm it in, involves the whole team. So it's a patient, the family, and the healthcare team. What would be your advice to, to, to that family that is watching you today mm -hmm. and they are having uh, you know, a, a patient with them? Uh, what would be your piece of advice that they can be able to, to grasp? That's something that they need to be remembering every single day mm -hmm. that will help them in this journey of, of providing uh, you know, care for their patient? Uh, I would say, um, don't shy away from taking care of the patient, of your mm -hmm. patient. Remember, today it's your patient, tomorrow it might be you. And these patients usually, when you get feedback from them, mm -hmm. they'll say uh, being there really mattered. So when, when you're just there for the patient as a family, as yeah. a caregiver, yeah. the patient really appreciates that. The patient feels okay. that they All are right. not a burden because what has happened is some people have um, like ignored that person because maybe they are always sick, they always need to be taken to hospital. Mm -hmm. But the care and support is really crucial. Um, I want us to bring this conversation to a close, and I would like to give you a time to have a final word, and as you do so, you can give a recommendation especially to the government, mm -hmm. your call to order for the government, because uh, there's somebody who is watching you today uh, that may be able to hear that voice. What mm -hmm. would be your recommendation when it comes to palliative care? Uh, of course, ram wrapping, wrapping it up within okay. 30 seconds. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> so I think first of all, I'm, I'm really uh, proud of the Ministry of Health because we launched the palliative care policy last uh, two weeks ago, which is the first policy. And this is a big milestone because it helps guide provision of these services. And I would encourage each and every one of us, if you have a patient who uh, needs care and support, needs these palliative care services, please ask your health care provider about the services. Please read more. And please don't shy away from for asking for help, even as a provider or as a patient. Uh, as a patient's caregiver, you also need the breaks. You also need to rejuvenate yourself. But don't shy away from taking care of these patients mm -hmm. and taking care of their families. Okay. So we want palliative care in every county so mm -hmm. that patients don't have to travel mm -hmm. uh, far to get these uh, crucial services. Thank you so much, Lakari. That is Dr. Esther um, Muinga, who is a palliative care specialist who has uh, you know, uh, give, given us a lot of information, actually. I believe that you've gotten what you need when it comes to cancer prevention and awareness and also palliative care. Dr. Ari, thank you so much for your time, and I appreciate it. Thank you, Ram. All right. Thank you so much. That brings us to the end of today's uh, uh, this conversation on uh, uh, health. Remember to keep the conversation going or even on our social media handles. We're taking a short break. We'll be back with more in a bit. This is why in the morning. <laughs>